Ulrich uh, from SAS Institute. Um, I'm uh, 22 years with SAS. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was um, briefly at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and before that, five years with the World Bank in Washington. I've been doing analytics or data science since a long time, always with SAS. Um, my first encounter of SAS was 1987 when I did an internship with uh, BASF. Okay, but this is not a project, um, all day project I do when I do consulting with companies. This is a project of my private passion. I like to go in the winter time into the mountains, uh, backcountry ski tours. And let me just give you a small preview of what this is about. Not I have, that I've been on this team on this um, tour, but um, this shows you what you can see. This was not the tour that I was on. I wish I would have been on this. But it shows you uh, quite a lot of different scenes which I have encountered myself also. Sometimes you get up very early at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. You go <coughs> to cabins uh, that are closed and they are full of snow. Or um, uh, you have to uh, cope with bad weather. And you have to cope, of course, with risks. You have to plan these trips very well. Um, I have two more videos on the risks. Let's have a first view here. Um, this will be underlaid a little bit with German language. I will comment it afterwards. But um, this will show you what can happen. Zwischen Wintersport und Lebensgefahr verläuft fließend. Wenn der Berg ins Rutschen gerät, ist der Mensch nur noch ein Spielball der Natur. Gegen Lawinen hat er kaum eine Chance. Der Schnee, der suggeriert Sicherheit, weil er so weiß ist, so weich ist. Aber in, innen drinnen lauert schon eine das heißt, der Wolf im Schafpelz. Abseits der Piste wird vielen das Risiko erst bewusst, wenn der Schnee sie unter sich begräbt. Der Schnee hat halt einfach eine wahnsinnige Kraft, die man eigentlich unterschätzt. So, also man denkt nicht, dass sich das so massiv anfühlt. Also es fühlt sich eher an wie Beton. Jedes Jahr bezahlen etwa 100 Menschen ihren Leichtsinn mit dem Leben. Die meisten sind Männer zwischen 30 und 40. Wenn einmal eine Person total verschüttet ist, das heißt, wenn der Kopf einmal unter den Schneemassen ist und wenn er sonst auch nichts irgendwie aus dem Schnee rausragt, dann kann man sagen, dass eigentlich äh, fast jeder Zweite, der total verschüttet ist, schlussendlich dann auch ums Leben kommt. Okay, um, so it showed you that um, uh, you see these nice uh, slopes uh, with uh, powder snow and um, basically uh, you just uh, don't imagine how much force there is in the snow once you trigger the avalanche and basically you are in there and you can not do anything else. You're just, just um, the victim there. I have another final video to show you. This shows you actually one avalanche and these persons here were lucky. They got out of it and, and they actually put those videos in the internet. The final video I show you is another one which ends luckily, uh, but you see it at the same time from two views. On the one hand, um, basically a comrade who takes a picture from the mobile phone on the top left and on the right side you see how it's the experience is to the victim on the helmet camera. So you see how it is to be inside um, the avalanche. No, I guess we'll see how this fucking goes. The more speed the better I'm pretty sure. Yeah. For sure. Ready? Get your cheese straight, B. Yes, sir. Stay ready as fuck. Oh, oh Christian! Fuck! 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 Oh, 
fuck? Okay, these are risks. Let me just show you some of facts uh, from numbers of Switzerland where the numbers are actually pretty sure. Um, in Switzerland, um, there are surveys, what people do in sports, and you can multiply those people who engage in um, backcountry ski tours with the days they go out. And so you come up with 2.4 million tour days per year. Um, the risk of being caught by an avalanche is uh, 0 0.1 per mil. Yeah? That means you have to climb up 10,000 summits and maybe you get caught then by one avalanche on, on the long term. 95% um, of all avalanche incidents are triggered by the victims themselves. You've seen it in all those movies. It's basically cutting with your skis or with a snowboard um, the slope, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the snow, and it disintegrates in one moment. Um, once the snow is moving around you, um, we heard before um, that uh, 21% uh, will be covered by snow, and those who covered, are covered by snow, 50% will die. Um, but from those who will not die, 75% are actually rescued within 30 minutes. So you have to be very fast, because underneath the snow, um, there's not a much air. Okay, so these are the risks. Uh, in Switzerland, we record more or less uh, 22 fatalities per year. Throughout the Alps, it's about 100. Okay, if you're not scared and you want to go on a ski tour with me, um, how would we go about this? We would plan this before. So, in a long time ago, or let's say until 10 years ago, we would read the books, uh, the tour guides on an area, we would look in the maps, we would take out um, a pencil and draw in the map the ideal route, and that would be what we were planning, and then we would listen to the weather forecast, uh, the snow forecast, and so on and we would discuss and decide if we go or we don't go. Um, nowadays, there are actually sites which propose uh, routes and they have documented GPS tracks. And one of it is uh, Shitun Guru, and I met the inventor, the operator, and the implementer of Shitun Guru in Switzerland, Günther Schmudlach, and I went on a seminar how to use this, and from there I actually got into discussions so, because I didn't understand certain things and from there we actually developed this project. But let me first show you how this works. If you want to plan nowadays a tour, you can actually uh, go on the site, you uh, specify your starting point, maybe the village from where you're starting and the maximum distance you want to drive to get to the point where you start your ski tour, you enter maybe uh, uh, the amount of uh, um, level you want to m walk up, maximum or minimum, because of your physical conditions and the difficulty. And then it opens up an uh, electronic map, a uh, Swiss topo, and you see on the left the list of the proposed tours. And let's assume, actually, I'm interested in one. But let, before that, I wanted to say one thing. The, the entire talk is about this one column, which I'm highlighting here. That is the avalanche risk prediction broken down for a specific tour and how to derive that. So um, here now I could actually select a nice summit, which is actually in the red area, high risk, but I could have a look at it and I open it up. The map opens electronically and I get the um, exact uh, line of um, here, Sorry, how does it work? I saw it. Ah, here. Uh, the exact line where I have to walk up. And um, I get it color coded. Um, so I see actually the difficult um, parts of it uh, with respect to avalanche risk. On the left side, you see uh, actually the avalanche forecast. You see uh, the compass rows with um, the um, uh, black parts of it, these are the risky areas 
of the slopes and the mountains. It's called the Kernzone in German. And you see also the uh, level, 1950 meters above that, it's getting risky because maybe there was no snow up there and below it was raining. Okay, um, but um, especially here uh, on the, that area there, I'm really in a very da big danger to, to the zone because this is uh, um, really a northern slope um, in, the, in the black area. And here I see, oh, this is really a risky part. I probably better not go there. Um, let's maybe go back to this list and take a less risky route. And um, in this case, the Drümenla, uh, which is orange. And I can look at this and here, um, I see I still have some red part of it, but these are southern slopes, yeah? because they are directed to the south. And uh, from that point of view, it's not so risky. And that's actually how you use this tool. You decide before you go and find out what is the best um, summit or route you want to go. How does this work? So first, this site uh, collects um, data, official data from avalanche incidents. 1,700 avalanche incidents that are recorded in Switzerland with the exact conditions, which slope, which direction, which weather forecasts, and so on. And on the other hand, the, let's say, negative cases, uh, 50,000 GPS tracks from people who send in their data after their tour, and they had a nice day without any problems. In addition, it uses the avalanche forecast on the left, from the SLF, the Swiss um, Avalanche Institute, and it breaks it down onto the mountain profile, which you see here on the, on the second one. This is a big, big work to break it down onto each slope and uh, each summit in Switzerland. In addition, below that, you get the avalanche terrain. That means once you know on which mountain you are, you know how steep it is there, which type of ground is there, is it uh, grass, is it forest, is it rocks, and so on. And you have properties, brown properties. And from there, you come uh, to the kernel density estimates for this um, quantitative reduction method, which then basically is mapped and derived as a real hazard map for each mountain in Switzerland. And then, once you know what is the in itinerary to go up, basically the line here, you have actually to derive the risk of the entire round. How does that work? Well, let's assume you want to go on this Drümenla and the route is the dotted line. You basically uh, have to look what is the risk at each and every point and there is a discretization done. Um, these maps are very accurate in Switzerland. You can do this on a 10 meters times 10 meters grid. And uh, now the question is how to derive basically the compound risk for the route. Well, you begin with the first step, yeah, the first point. Let's assume it's like throwing the dice. The avalanche risk is 1 6. Yeah? So you don't want to be caught by an avalanche, so it's 1 minus 1 6. Yeah? So you go this first step. And then you're still alive. And uh, so you can do the next step. So you go again, one minus whatever the relative risk is there at this point, and so on. So you have to basically uh, multiply your route up point by point. Yeah? And at the end, of course, you're up. You, didn't, you were not caught by an avalanche. But since we're interested in the avalanche risk, we take basically one minus this product. Yeah? That's the risk of the route, the compound risk of the route. That's calculated um, whenever a new avalanche um, bulletin is published, basically at 5 o'clock and at 8 o'clock in the morning, and um, calculated for all the 1,200 routes in Switzerland. And then you can derive the risk, the <coughs> avalanche risk, and uh, from there you can actually segment this in those uh, traffic lighting and you can publish it. So that's available for your selection when you go on tour. The European Avalanche uh, Danger Scale is uh, discrete 
from 1 to 5. Um, 5 is very, very rarely used. Um, uh, 4 is quite frequently still, but the most uh, frequent are actually 1, 2, and 3. Most accidents happen at level 3. And um, so this kernel density X estimate in the middle, we saw uh, in the previous slides, has some inbuilt problems. Because basically, the scale is discrete, but the risk is never discrete. I mean, the risk is continuous. It goes up, even if the slope of a, of a, um, of a valley increases, the risk goes continuously up. So we need to derive um, some continuous estimate of the risk from the available data. And that is where I had problems in understanding how the system works, and I entered in discussions with Günther Schmudlach uh, to understand this better. And then I said, okay, listen, why don't you try out one thing? Um, you use the available information of all variables that you have and the text to predict um, the, uh, the danger level. And from the prediction, hopefully this prediction will not be 100% accurate. So you get deviations. And from there, you can actually uh, derive um, some uh, actually uh, scattering around those lines. OK. So given basically this discrete lines of the avalanche bulletin, um, we would like to have something that spreads it out and um, idly. Yeah? But um, let's see how we do this now. So we have the text of the um, avalanche risk bulletin, and we can basically derive a, uh, a predictor. OK, let's have a look at the data. What is available? So the um, avalanche bulletin in Switzerland is actually produced every day by an institute in Davos. It's called the Institute of Snow and Avalanche Research, SLF. And uh, they have a very nice online archive. You can go there, select the season, last season, for example. You get all the PDFs. They are ordered uh, by name with the date. So this is the 25th of April this year um, at 5 o'clock. And we get it in English, but we get it also, since Switzerland is a multi-language country, we get it also in French, we get it also in Italian and in German. OK. So how do we derive a data model from this? Well, here we have one example bulletin um, with all the inf information that's given. And um, the first thing I mentioned already before in the introduction, we saw the uh, critical expositions. The black part is where you should be very, very careful that day. And um, there are actually eight areas in the compass row, so you get uh, eight binary variables. The second part is um, the maximum and minimum elevation. Again, here the black part of it, you have to pay attention. So if you are above 2,200 meters, pay attention. There's probably wind drift or new snow. Or sometimes in spring, it's below a certain elevation because there it's already warm or the sun is already shining and you have um, wet avalanche danger. Then um, you have the type of the snow, yeah? Glide snow, new snow, old snow, wet snow, wind drift snow, and so on. And you have the description in the text. And finally, last but not least, you have basically this uh, danger level on a discrete scale from 1 to 5. OK, so this is the data table for the analysis. I just um, sign again here the uh, symbols of the variables. So uh, you see what's available here. And here on the right, we see the text in four languages. Now the exercise is to predict the danger based on those informations, including the text in those four languages. How do we go about this? Here um, we see the logical process flow of the analysis. Again, the uh, number of uh, documents that we have here is uh, 5,400 in the archive because uh, then they changed the methodology at that point in time. So if we go before, um, it's difficult to compare it with um, the current data. So first, uh, we uh, take uh, notice of um, the table uh, in the process flow. We partition the data in training validation test, training data for training the model, uh, validation data to compare different models or select the best model, 
and the test data actually to uh, then get an out of sample estimate how good this um, prediction might be. If you have uh, competing models, you compare those models and model comparison on the validation data. Here we have an example process flow on the left side using the text variables, on the right side not using the text variables, just the structured variables um, which you see in the symbols. And we see the text um, has uh, actually quite some advantage using it. The average uh, squared error on the validation data is only 0.05. Uh, while um, with uh, only the structured variables, it's uh, 0, 1, 1, 9. And in the test data, you basically see that there's still a little bit overfitting. Okay, um, let's go one further back, one step further back. The gradient boosting <laughs> model is um, a model, you probably, most of you know it, but I just um, explained it a little bit. Um, it's an iteration. Um, ensemble of decision trees. A decision tree looks very fast uh, for splits in order to find um, pure nodes. Uh, here, down here, the dark ones are nodes where um, you basically have one danger level, uh, maybe B3 or 4. And uh, the idea is to have a good prediction with high concentration in one level and not in the others. The um, gradient boosting um, uh, is basically a little bit similar like how you would lock, look for an avalanche victim once it's under, covered under snow. If you are on tour, you have certain predictors with you. You should be equipped with this. You have the avalanche beacon transceiver, a small device that sends a signal. And uh, the first thing is you use that and you run down, you know that from numerics, conjugated gradients, um, yeah, uh, the first on the top left. But you have also other predictors. You have um, the avalanche probe you can call for help, maybe get a hel helicopter or rescue squad. And um, so the um, gradient boosting uh, compared to the decision tree is actually sampling your predictors, the variables, but also your observations, your cases, and creates uh, a series of models that are then uh, actually averaged out. And, um, the boosting part of it makes uh, that you put, once you found your avalanche victim, you put it back under the snow, you search again using some different um, sampling or uh, different variables. And uh, that helps uh, to uh, reduce your prediction error. Okay, let's move one step further back. So you can use uh, text uh, mining to um, uh, analyze the text. So there are some parameters uh, that you can actually uh, select. I'll come to them a little bit later. Let's first look at the results. First, you get um, the terms that will no longer be used, uh, dropped terms, uh, basically be because they are on a stop list. And then you see the kept terms. You see in how many different documents they appear. And in this analysis, you see, no surprise, the most frequent term is avalanche. Uh, followed by snow and release and drift. If you see a small plus there, this is a feature of the SAS software, uh, there is natural language processing involved based on the language you selected. Um, this is a stemming, put, uh, putting the terms into the ground form, the um, plurals or the declinated or con conjugated terms will put and uh, actually in, in one term so you don't have so many um, variables. Basically here in these texts, uh, depending on the language, we have more or less thousand different distinct terms. Um, but uh, there's something else that is interesting. These are the noun groups. Noun groups, let me give you an example. Yeah? There is the German term Gleitschnee Lawine, uh, which in English is gliding avalanche. And in French, it's avalanche de glissement. And in Italian, it's valange per scivolamento di neve. So you see, uh, um, from dependent on the language, you need actually um, to figure out which terms are close to each other. We had uh, this presentation before with uh, term embeddings. They actually get to this very much. In our software, we have uh, first uh, the um, possibility to detect noun groups as they appear in the text. And, um, uh, but 
You can also actually go beyond this. Um, for example, if you uh, want to have some weighted sum of terms, and these are then text topics. The question is how you determine the weights of these text topics. Uh, with a singular value decomposition, that's is basic, pretty basic. Um, everybody, uh, all software has this now. But it's a very good, uh, simple approach that you can do. Uh, you compress your thousand features that you would have theoretically as predictors to some main components. In this case, I selected 40. And um, here we have a view, a graphical view on those text topics. They get a label with the terms of the highest weight for each text topic. And um, they are basically new interval variables that we can use. And if we select one, we get this term cloud with the visualization of the terms with a higher weight. And some of them are very interesting. This one here I selected. You see very well um, the, the problem of wet avalanches. And uh, you see, as the day progresses, that means when the sun shines more, no, you have higher risk, uh, warm solar radiation, um, and you see also moist snow, yeah, which has nothing to do with the term wet avalanches, but it's actually in the same sense. And it's detected automatically by the singular value decomposition. I did not um, enter anything here. This is a nice part of text analytics projects when you look at these uh, um, singular value decomposition and the text topics and you discover certain um, connections. Well, so we can attach these text topics as variables. Basically, in this factorization here, uh, we have the right side, the V, the v matrix, yeah, or basically what is behind uh, those things that we saw before. We ac can attach those variables to our base table and use them now as predictors because Texts that are similar in the terms, they have similar um, text topic dimensions. And we can basically now use them as predictors. We translated our problem from using text to variables. And now we can actually run, um, but we have different options. So first we have um, the four languages that we can select. Then we can uh, use uh, different parts of the speech tagging, that means differentiating between verbs, adverbs, nouns, uh, and so on. Uh, extract noun groups, we have seen that. Um, extract entities, in this case it's interesting for locations because you have different locations in Switzerland, the Tessin, the um, Engadin, or the Valleys, where the, the conditions are uh, frequently different than on the north side of the Alps. Um, you can stem the terms, we saw that, to put them in the ground form. And so basically you have lots of options and after each different type of parameterization of the text topics you can run a gradient boosting. But not only a single gradient boosting, I uh, ran it with uh, auto-tuning, uh, with genetic um, algorithm for tuning the uh, hyperparameters uh, better. So we got actually 100 runs there. So from there we got actually lots of pipelines of flows. I did not draw all these flows. I did never create that um, because basically it would have been uh, too much work. Uh, what is this process flow in the middle? I don't know what this is. But um, I can actually uh, take these components and write a small uh, function that you see in the, um, in the line here. And uh, I can parameterize it. So I hand over the text table. Um, I can decide with a parameter to stem, yes or no, noun groups, yes or no, tagging, yes or no, entity extraction, stop word lists, the four languages, or analyze the text on the document level or on the sentence level. And then I write just a loop around this um, and I let it run. It ran, I think, five hours about um, on my computer and we had uh, 25,000 model evaluations. And now um, I hope you are also a little bit curious what will be the best model. Um, we have uh, four languages. And so the first thing is what might be the best language? Yeah? Will it be English 
Will it be French or Italian or maybe even German, no? uh, the language of long incomprehensible terms. But before actually uh, we get to the winner, let's think about it. If one language wins, what is the reason why it would win? Yeah? Is it that the authors or the translators of the text did a better job and were more precise? That means there's a problem at the text generation. Is it that the nature of the language is more exact for this task? Could be also. Or is it that our software is poorer in one language or the other? Yeah, so we have lots of quality issues. But let's show. And the winner is Italian language uh, with a 5.4% average squared error on the text, but directly followed by all the others. So basically, this can be just an artifact of uh, how the uh, training validation test data was split. And in fact, if I ran it again, the gradient boosting, you get it somehow a little bit different uh, sequence. Yeah? But what is interesting is how much was the improvement compared to using only the structured variables. So the, on the structured variables, we were just uh, with um, about 18%. And basically, text analytics cut down the errors uh, to one third of the baseline. And the other part, which is interesting, is, um, well, what were the winning parametrizations? Yeah? In fact, this is just the very top of the table with uh, 25,000 lines. So what I did uh, in the next step um, to use the result uh, on the test data here, sorry, this column here as a target variable and try to basically to segment and predict it based on those parameterization to find out across all parameterization, all languages, if there are some winning strategies. And um, well, the result is actually interesting because basically, I put those numbers a little bit bigger so you can see, the first split is whether you use a text uh, on the document level or on the sentence level. And um, after that, you have also already the selection of the different languages. So it shows this is the most important decision to do. All the other parameterization, they don't change a lot. And this interesting finding, so um, uh, I thought I wanted just to present this. Um, OK, so let's uh, see what is then the final result. We started out like this, and we wished to have something like this in the best case. Yeah? But how did it look? It looked like this. Um, and uh, you see that um, those values are spread out. But you see that they overlap somehow. No? The yellow are somehow a little bit in the green area. The uh, yellow um, in the orange and the red also in the orange and so on. So I thought uh, maybe it's interesting to see how much we, sc we screw up the data by this method now. So I looked at uh, precision and recall basically discretizing this prediction again. So basically you see here on the top these intervals, I basically uh, uh, cut down the predicted variables uh, in the interval 1 to 1.5, 1.5, 2.5, and so on, and compared it then with the original um, uh, level. And you see that we are uh, at very high level of um, accuracy, uh, recall, and precision. That shows actually that works pretty well. We are still not at the final point, but um, uh, I think we will go and use this uh, in the next uh, set of the um, development of Skitour in Google. There was also another interesting part. Since the last season, the um, institute, the Snow Institute, uh, the Avalanche and Snow Institute in Switzerland, has an internal variable where they say, OK, this is level three, but it's really on the top part ceiling of it, or it's at the bottom floor of three, and so on. So we have this for one season, and we could look how this prediction that was implemented um, performs on these levels in between. And actually here also we get pretty good results. And that is promising. So um, let me finally sum up what are the results. Uh, the modeling, I mean, I've been doing lots of text analytics models for customers, they pay and so on. In general, it's uh, pretty tough uh, if you have interval variables to get a good result. So I didn't really believe that something good would come out. But here I was really um, surprised how good it worked. 
And um, the, so just uh, for you as a takeaway, if structured data does not provide enough predictive power, maybe you have some text, try to use it. Um, in my uh, analysis here, I could cut down the um, error from 18% to 6% on average. The different language have similar performance. Um, we have a stable quali quality across authors, languages, and also the SAS software, which is also a good thing. And um, if you can, and if you have enough clean data uh, in terms of the, the punctuation in your text, um, subdivide your text into sentences. I had a problem here, for example, in the German text, you had always uh, Z point, D, B point, zum Beispiel, for example, and I had to uh, actually uh, use a special um, way of going around this problem. Um, but uh, if there are lots of abbreviations in there, you might have some problems. Try it out if you can. And um, this um, predicted level now is used to, to develop a better risk calculation in this uh, site. And um, from this project, actually, we discussed lots of other um, side projects, which will actually begin to, to capital the next season if we are not in the mountain slope skiing. Um, but uh, anyway, um, I thank you for your attention. And um, maybe see you next season in the low danger powder slopes. Um, this uh, heat map is actually the most popular uh, areas where people go uh, based on those uh, 50,000 GPS routes. Thank you very much.